Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Let's get to our key interview this hour with Carlisle's David Rubenstein. David, of course, uh, host of Peer-to-Peer Conversations on Bloomberg Television and Radio. You can catch David's interview with Fed Chair Jay Powell on the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer, airing July 24th at 9 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg TV. Let's go to the source. David, patiently waiting for us in our Washington, D.C. Bureau. David, (laughs) great to have you here. We've been counting down to your conversation uh, with Jay Powell. Um, We watched. How did this come about? Was it planned for a long time? I'm just curious. Okay. Well, um, I am the uh, chairman of the Economic Club of Washington, and uh, as in that capacity, I often interview government leaders and business leaders. And uh, Jay Powell and, uh, had been somebody I'd interviewed before. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had worked at my firm uh, a number of years ago, well before he was at the Fed, and so uh, we worked out a date that he, I would do this interview today. And we had about 700 people there, and obviously a live uh, TV audience. David, I, I, we we were chuckling the whole time. I mean, this was like uh, a, a really a, a, a Powell that you don't see at press conferences, a Powell that you don't see every day. It's clear that you two are familiar with one another. What, what did you want to get out of the interview? Because we know that he's not going to give us any indication about a rate, you know, rate path. Um, he established that at the top of the interview. What did you want to get out of it? Well, I think it's always good to humanize well-known people and people can understand them better and the way they make decisions and the way they uh, kind of handle their job. And I thought humanizing him would be always good. Clearly, when you're a chairman of the Fed, you talk in what I've often called Fed speak, which is to say it's very difficult for the average person to understand it. But, but Jay does a better job than some of his predecessors in speaking in common English because he's not a trained economist. And I just thought giving people an update on his perspectives on the economy would be a good thing. I mean, obviously, as you point out, he's not going to announce at an interview with me that he's lowering interest rates. You can't expect that. But I think he gave a pretty good uh, description of how they decide to lower interest rates or increase interest rates. And I thought it was informative. And therefore, I thought, uh, you know, he accomplished his goal, which is to kind of, you know, show people how he makes decisions. And I accomplished my goal, which is to kind of humanize the chairman of the Fed a little bit more than maybe he otherwise would be. Well, David, help us understand your relationship. You mentioned that you guys do go back years, of course. He was a partner at the Carlisle Group before he went into public service. Um, I'm wondering if you're in touch with him regularly now, um, if you consider him a friend. Just give us an idea of your relationship with him. I wouldn't say I'm in touch with him regularly. When you're chairman of the Fed, uh, you know, I I think it's somebody like me doesn't want to be calling him up all the time. And, you know, I I don't want to look like I'm trying to get information from him. And I he worked at Carlisle for years, but I wouldn't say I was his closest friend or vice versa. So I, I know him reasonably well. Um, I've interviewed him, I think, three times or four times at the Economic Club of Washington. And I have a good relationship with him, but I wouldn't say we're you know, close as friends. But I, I certainly like him and admire what he's done uh, for the country and the job that he's had. You know, what's interesting, too, and something we've talked a lot about, David, is, you know, the neutral rate and what he thinks about uh, that two percent goal that the Federal Reserve has, right. um, he said the neutral rate is probably higher today. Uh, monetary policy is restrictive, but not severely restrictive. I am curious how you see things. Do you think the neutral rate doesn't make sense anymore? That it does need to be higher? And what is your expectation, or what you think the Fed should be doing when it comes to interest rates right now? Well, I think the country will do much better off listening to Jay Powell's views <laughs> on where the interest rates should go than probably my views on interest rates. But I think it's a general sense that the market is believing that there will be a cut. And uh, I think Jay made it clear that he doesn't listen to the political situation. So I have said in speeches that I thought it would be unlikely that the Fed would want to cut during a presidential election period of time. But I think he's made it clear that that's not his view or the view of the FOMC, that if they think the data warrants a cut, they will have a cut. And therefore, the Fed could do something at the end of July when they meet, or they could do something again when they, when they meet in September. And I, my guess is that sometime before uh, the Fed meets uh, uh, after the election, they will do something. That'd be my current thinking. The economy could change, and obviously data is everything. But right now, the markets are anticipating, and I think the Fed is not shutting down the idea that something could happen before uh, the election. 
Before the election, okay. Do you think that the election in any way sways? I mean, we're all human, right? And we can say we're very objective, but we're human and impacted by lots of things that are going on in this world. Do you think that Jay Powell and policymakers at the Fed might be swayed a little bit, a small influence when it comes to the November election, presidential election? I think the Fed, um, if everything Jay says is that they don't really pay attention to the election dates. Um, and I think right now, since so many people pay attention to the markets and the interest rates uh, where they are, that I, I think that the Fed will do what the, what the data suggests is appropriate. And when the data gets to the point where they see inflation more or less getting to 2 percent and the economy softening a bit, I suspect they will not wait until after the election because they don't want to be seen as political. And therefore, while they might be criticized by some for lowering interest rates before the end of the uh, uh, before the election's over. I, I just think the Fed has given enough signals, including today, that they're not going to worry about the election. They'll do what the data suggests is appropriate. I do wonder, David, as you said, you've talked with Jay Powell several times, certainly in this format. So, you know, monetary policy, obviously, and the economy first and foremost. And there are certain things that Jay Powell will go. You guys laugh about <laughs> some of the things he will obviously not reveal. But having said that, at the end of the conversation, when it comes to the things the Bloomberg audience cares so much about in terms of monetary policy and the economy, what was your key takeaway from Jay Powell? My key takeaway from the interview and with my discussion with him is that he's a man who's very much on top of the data. He enjoys the job, not worn out by it, um, doesn't say, woe is to me, I have got all this pressure on my shoulder. He's, I think he can deal with it quite well. He's used to it. He's been in the chair for quite some time. I think he's reasonably happy now with where the economy is. Remember, we didn't go into the hard landing that everybody was predicting. Yeah. Uh, people thought there would be a recession the last year or this year. That didn't happen. So whoever gets credit for it, uh, the Fed deserves some share of that credit because they, they managed the economy into a really nice soft landing, so-called. And so right now, while unemployment is going up, I don't think it's going up by such a, a level that's uh, scaring people. And I think the markets are in pretty good shape and the economy is in pretty good shape. He didn't want to comment on the market, the idea of the so-called Trump trade returning uh, after this weekend's uh, horrific yes. event. Um, he was clear about that up on top, but I'm uh, at the top of the interview. But I'm curious about your view and, and what you think is being priced into markets right now, David. The Fed chair not weighing in, but politically, what is being yeah. priced in right now? Well, clearly, uh, the events of the weekend, uh, no doubt, scared a lot of people about uh, the violence that is still uh, prevalent in this country in many areas, unfortunately. And so, fortunately, um, uh, we did not have uh, an assassination, though one person did die, uh, tragically, and another person is still in the hospital uh, for the wounds that that, that person suffered as well. Um, sad, sad situation. Obviously, the investigations will figure out what the federal, what the Secret Service could have done differently or better. I don't, I'm not an expert in that area, so I just can't say what they will find. But clearly, um, you know, we haven't eliminated violence from our, our political situation, unfortunately. David, you've served in the federal government. Uh, you were chief counsel to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee subcommittee back in the 70s, uh, deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy during the Carter administration. The democracy has faced other heavy periods before. It feels rather heavy today. Is there something different this time around? You are, I feel like it's safe to say, a student of history. You respect past leaders and what they've done. Um, how do you make sense of this particular political and historical period? Well, it's difficult to, to really put it in context right now because you can't really tell what the historical impact it is until many years afterwards. But uh, right now, the country seems to be fairly bitterly divided between the Democrats and Republicans. And it wasn't the case 50 years ago or so. When John Kennedy ran for president against Richard Nixon in 1960, they campaigned in most of the states because they didn't know how the states would go. Now, the country's fairly divided, so we know how almost all the states are going to go. There are only five or six, maybe seven states where it's a kind of a swing state. So it's much different than it used to be. The tensions between both sides seem to be much greater than they used to be. Bipartisanship um, is something that is not as common as it used to be uh, in Washington, D.C. So we, I don't know whether the events of this weekend will scare people into saying we should try to you know, be less, um, uh, I'd say, violent in our rhetoric and less uh, condemning of, of other sides. But clearly, President Trump has suggested that he would make a more unifying speech than he otherwise going to, was going to make. And I think President Biden's speech last night was designed to also have a unifying impact. Whether we can unify our country in a, in a way like this, uh, that we, I think we should, I don't know. But it will probably have some beneficial impact, though obviously the events were tragic. David, are you optimistic, given the heated political environment right now? 
I'm optimistic that uh, the country is in reasonable shape economically. Uh, politically, we can, we can do more than we should, to, than we have been doing to kind of bring the country together. And uh, that part, uh, the jury is still out, but I'm hopeful that, that while the events were tragic over the weekend, that they'll have some beneficial impact in getting both sides, Democrats and Republicans, to try to work together more cooperatively. Jay Powell said to you, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, when you think about the future for the United States, politically, economically, what's top of mind? And curious if uh, you have any plans to maybe want to be at the Federal Reserve. You guys talked about if it's a good job. Well, I, I think it's really hard to kind of say that all of a sudden uh, we're going to eliminate all the, the, the schisms that we've had in the last couple of years. Clearly, there are a lot of tensions between the two side, political sides. Jay Powell um, has been appointed by a Republican president and reappointed by a Democratic president, and he's done a really good job of kind of walking a fine line of not trying to be seen as political or Democratic or Republican. I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. I think he's done an excellent job as chairman of the Fed. All right. I'm not going to ask you then about chairman of the Fed. <laughs> if okay. you have any thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but you can answer if you want. Well, I think he's done a good job. And remember, this is not a job that anybody um, really thinks is an easy job. Many people who have emerged mm -hmm. from the job, um, you know, are, are generally uh, applauded after they've served. But when they're serving, very often they get criticized by both sides. And it's hard to be chairman of the Fed. And in fact, as one chairman of the, uh, the Fed once said, William McChesney Martin, uh, my job is to take away the punch bowl at the party, <laughs> which is to say, take away all the, the fun that you would, you would want to get. And so that's yeah. the job of the chairman of the Fed is to take away the punch bowl. And, yeah. and people don't like that. Absolutely. David Rubenstein, thank you so much. Busy day for you and uh, so appreciate checking in with you. Bloomberg host and Carlisle co-founder and co-chair David Rubenstein. You can catch his show in conversation with Jay Powell July 24th at 9 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Let's not forget we are in the midst, the beginning of earnings it's season. It's just getting started. You know that because the big banks are reporting. This is <laughs> just like the beginning, Carol. The official, unofficial yeah. start. Yeah, they did continue this morning. Goldman Sachs reporting results. Stock is off its highs of its set of the session, but we did see uh, some move to the upside. Goldman, uh, among the headlines, the trading unit powering a surge in earnings in the second quarter. It also plans to cut down on stock repurchases after the Fed's annual stress test required it to set aside more capital. The bank, again, pushing back against those results. For more, we turn to David Conrad, Managing Director over at KBW right here in New York City. David, um, first up, politics front and center after what happened over the weekend. And certainly, the economy always front and center. We just talked with David Rubenstein, who interviewed Fed Chair Jay Powell at the Economic Club of Washington. Um, let's start with politics. I'm just curious how it might impact the sector that you cover and follow so closely, banking. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on. You know, it, it, it's a big uh, question mark for investors. Certainly we saw, you know, when, when Trump was elected president the first time, uh, a big bump in financials. Uh, part of that was because they paid the highest tax rates. And so the big tax cut really led that. But there was also a hope for deregulation and consolidation in the industry. And I think that latter point would probably hold true um, if he were to be reelected. I think there's a lot of pent up demand for consolidation, uh, which I think would uh, would open the doors for that. Um, I think there's also another school of thought of, of what may happen to inflation and the long end of the curve as well under that scenario, which which may put a little bit of pressure on financials. But I think overall, I think the conclusion would be um, if Trump were to win, it would be, you know, less regulations and maybe opening the door for more m and So maybe good for some of the big banks and some of the financial companies, maybe not necessarily for consumers? Well, I, I, I think maybe longer term, if, 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 if that one scenario were to be the case where it turned out to be inflationary and the long end backed up, that would be the case. But I think, you know, that that's just one school of thought. But certainly, um, you know, we, we, we would expect, um, you know, a little bit for the bigger banks and the, and the broader M&A perspective, but also for, you know, the regional banks for further consolidation would be 
you know, also an attractive place to be. All right. Having said that, we also, as Tim mentioned, uh, David Rubenstein, obviously of Carlisle, but also hosts the show here at Bloomberg, did interview Fed Chair Jay Powell, and they talked about the economic environment. What color have you gotten from the big banks? Obviously, Goldman this morning, but we had uh, J.P. Morgan, City, Wells Fargo last week. What are you getting from those banks uh, and their results and what it says to you about, yeah. first of all, the security and health of our financial banking system, uh, and then also what it's telling us about the environment. Well, there's there's really two. It's it's really kind of split with what we've seen. First of all, capital markets. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Investment banking is up, you know, well over twenty percent, fifty percent for J.P. Morgan year over year. So we saw a lot of underwriting um, um, and trading as well. And so we did see a pretty strong environment for capital markets. The flip side of it is, though, is we didn't see barely any loan demand outside of credit card borrowings. And so the, the, the loan demand is, continues to be weak. And as we're at this peak in rates before maybe the Fed starts to, to drop rates, we're getting the, the tailwind of um, deposit costs still. So consumers are still kind of demanding higher, higher rates on their deposits, and that, that's hurting the net interest income. What? I'd say the other aspect, too, is we're still seeing higher charge-offs in credit cards. So I think that's right now more of a normalization state, but we are seeing higher charge-offs there. How much higher do those charge-offs go? Yeah, I think I think we're about at the normalized state, um, but the borrowing has increased materially, you know, over the past year. So uh, I think for the most part, we're probably going to go up, you know, probably another fifty basis points. But you know, we, we we've come from a one and a half percent rate to now pushing three and a half, four percent. So I think we're near the top for the prime borrowers uh, in terms of the marginal increase in credit card costs. Hey, let's go through some of the banks. Obviously, Goldman reporting uh, in today's session. I'm looking at Goldman shares. They're just off their highs. They're up about 2%. Go back to Friday. JP Morgan was down more than 1% on their results. You had uh, Citi down almost 2% on its results. And then if I pull up Wells Fargo, uh, it was also, yeah. we saw really taking a hit in the Friday yeah. trade. It was down about 6%. So walk us through those in particular and which names you might be a little bit more worried about, which ones you like. Yeah, I would say, first of all, J.P. Morgan was down on Friday, really more for positioning and, and, and its valuation. Um, it, it, it's, its P.E. Is, is near the high watermark for its historical range, you know, pushing 12 and a half, 13 times, 2025 numbers. So it's an over -owned name. It's a very popular name. I think fundamentally it was very strong, but that's just technicals on, on ownership on why it kind of pulled back. They didn't change their guidance materially, and so that was – Maybe modestly disappointing, but I think that's more on valuation. Goldman, um, you know, I think it's really the place you want to be right now. You want to be a market sensitive revenues. You want to kind of be in the place where investment banking is still probably operating 20% below normalized levels. So there's a lot of momentum uh, with revenues there. Uh, I also think what's interesting about Goldman is their restructure in the balance sheet, both, you know, limiting consumer exposure, but also you know, unwinding some some heavy capital components of their their on balance sheet equity investments. And so that's going to free up a lot of capital. I think buybacks may be a little bit lower from this current quarter, as you mentioned earlier, but still very strong. You know, City is a long term turnaround story. Um, you know, I think actually the quarter, though, itself was a little bit disappointing. They had, you know, they had a headline beat, but in reality, they missed on revenues. Uh, they had strong wealth uh, performance, which was which was needed there. That that has been struggling a bit. And had a really strong performance there, but they had declining service um, services revenue, and and they didn't perform as well on trading as Goldman or J.P. Morgan did. Okay. And then lastly, you know, Wells got beat up a little bit. That's also a long term uh, turnaround story. They disappointed on their NII guide. Uh, as well as their expense guide. And so that was a bit of a setback in the long-term story there. Hey, David, um, help us move this forward to tomorrow when we hear from Morgan Stanley and we hear from Bank of America. Starting with Bank of America, such a great read on the consumer. Um, what should we be looking for? What should our investing audience be looking for? I, I think with Bank of America, it, it, it's two components which are really the same. I think originally, you know, initially on the print, you want to look at the deposit costs and see was Wells Fargo's higher deposit costs a a read through for B of A or was it isolated to Wells Fargo? So we want to see if, if the quarter over quarter increase in deposit cost is 
low double digits or is it more like JP Morgan that was up five dips quarter on quarter? The second thing that's important is the earning guidance that, that will come up on the call. Uh, we anticipate really positive uh, guidance for NII uh, for Bank of America. And that's partly because the reason why we like the stock is it's under earning in several areas. For instance, they have some uh, uh, interest rate swaps that are over its commercial loan book, which has really brought down the yield. Um, they're actually only yielding Fed funds levels for their for their commercial loan book. As those roll over, we think there's going to be a material pickup in those yields. And so we think, you know, that because of that, because of credit cards, we think that we'll have higher NII towards the end of the year. David, really quickly, 15 seconds, you got new money to commit. What name do you put it in among those big banks you just talked about? And very quickly, please. Yeah, I, th I think it's Goldman Sachs. I think the other name we haven't mentioned is Bank of New York. That is actually the best quarter we saw on Friday. It was up five and a half percent. All right, David, thank you so much. David Conrad, he's managing director over at KBW. The KBW Bank in Index, by the way, is up about 15% year to date. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Donald Trump, indeed, confirmation has picked uh, the junior senator from the state of Ohio, J.D. Vance, as his running mate. Having said that, let's get to our next guest, because someone who really is just so great at, uh, as I said, tying together Wall Street, the economy, and obviously throwing in politics, uh, and someone we turn to a lot to make sense of our tumultuous times. And we're talking about Peter Atwater. He is economist. He did work on Wall Street. He writes a newsletter called Financial Insights. He's an adjunct professor of economics at William & Mary. He's also the author of the book, The Confidence Map, Charting a path from chaos to clarify, um, which came out last year. Hey, uh, Peter joins us from Pennsylvania. Uh, Peter, good to have you back with us. Um, look, we got to ask you about the breaking news here. The former president, uh, the um, who has not officially been nominated yet, has tapped rising Republican star J.D. Vance as his running mate. I know you're here to talk about economics, um, but certainly the economy is tied to politics. Uh, how are you interpreting this news? Um, I'm not at all surprised, Tim. Um, J.D. Vance is situated perfectly in the center of the country. Um, he is a figure who has played extraordinarily well at both ends of the economic spectrum. And I think that for Trump, he is a ardent supporter. He will be loyal. And uh, as he's demonstrated um, throughout this campaign, he is a fighter for the Trump presidency. And forgive me, your book, of course, uh, The Confidence Map, Charting a Path from Chaos to Clarity. There's a lot going on here. So, Peter, forgive my my uh, mistake there. Having said that, do you feel like we have more chaos in this market and an economic environment um, or more clarity? So I, I think that the, the market has really taken the boost in uh, President, former President Trump's popularity as an indicator of inevitability. Uh, I, if I've read one word in the last 72 hours, it's landslide. Hmm. And I think that with that, investors now feel um, free to look at all things Trump presidency related. You've mentioned you know, prison stocks and, and firearm makers. But I think that this is a clear sense that, in, that investors believe in the inevitability of the outcome. And, and that is something that we tend to see with geopolitical events, that they don't matter until the crowd sees them as inevitable. And then everybody plays catch up. But is it inevitable? I mean, there's still three months to the election, more than three months, Peter. Yeah, there are words that I don't like as a, as a, as a sentiment expert. I, I hate the words unstoppable, inevitable, unsaleable. Um, you know, go back to the 2016 presidential campaign and there's a Time magazine cover that says, you know, can anyone stop Hillary Clinton? And you look at the, the polls over that campaign and that marked the high water mark. Hmm. And so the, the risk for the Trump campaign is that this represents this sense of inevitability represents a major peak in confidence and that we see some sort of retreat. Is it enough for you know, to make a difference in November, we'll see. But, I, but I'd also say at the same time, Tim, 
there is a sense of defeatedness among Democrats that's equally comparable. And so you have both extremes in mood on broad display today. So, hmm. So I'm thinking about investors who are listening and trying to kind of connect all the dots. Um, you know, and at the same time, you talk about this kind of feeling of inevitability in terms of the outcome of the November election. Pollsters will say, you don't really know until two weeks before, although we'll watch the momentum. Um, and a lot can happen in the next few months. Having said that, how do you think about then what this all means, Peter, for what conclusions should investors be thinking about when they've got to just invest in this environment? Do they hold off? Can they make decisions? So I think investors have to plan for what they can imagine, but also be well prepared for what they can't. This is this is a time where, you know, if if I look at the Fed and AI and and now the the Trump, um, you know, what we've seen in terms of the Trump momentum, there is a sense of inevitability and and omnipotence that is multidimensional, and so. I find that a fascinating contrast to the backdrop of geopolitical uncertainty and, and social unrest that we see. And so I think investors need to be positioned for the potential event that we see something come out of the blue that upends confidence in, in a way that they're not prepared for. Because if, yeah. if anything, I'm just thinking this political environment keeps reminding us that something can just come out of the blue at this point. Yeah, I mean, it, it is so striking the parallels to the to the late 1960s. I mean, there, too, we had markets at record highs and yet significant social political unrest below the scenes that inevitably took its toll on the markets. Not to mention a DNC that also happened in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm wondering, Peter, uh, about what those um, events could be. I mean, we didn't. A lot of people didn't see a pandemic coming. Um, that was a surprise to a lot of folks. What What should be on our investor audience radar? I think investors should be paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine. If we've If we've seen anything, it is that low natural gas prices tend to create energy in the Kremlin. So I'm, I'm focused there. I think that we need to appreciate geopolitically, broadly speaking, that it's not left or right that matters. It's all about it, the incumbent versus the, the opposition. And so this is an environment where we will vote out incumbents no matter their political identity and alignment. And so investors need to be thinking about what does a G7 world, what does a G30 look, world look like without incumbents in place? Do you think right now, you something that you look at, Peter, just one last question, we've got about a minute or so left here, that you do talk, think about the gap between mood and financial markets. Is there a wide gap at this point in your view? It is a gap that I, I don't believe has ever been wider. I mean, I look at the, the mood of those at the very bottom and it bears no resemblance to the record highs that we're seeing in the financial markets. And that to me is deeply troubling. What, we have one minute left. What, what, is the, what are possible implications of that? Well, those at the very bottom mood wise, it's all about me here now. And say so that they don't care about the concerns of others. They don't plan for the future. There's, there's an impulsivity and a high emotion that goes along with behaviors that tends to run counter to the interests of investors. All right, gonna leave it on that note. Peter, thank you as always, um, so appreciate it. Peter Atwater, of course, joining us uh, there. As we mentioned, economist, he's worked on Wall Street. His newsletter, Financial Insights, something that we get regularly and read it. He's an adjunct professor of economics over at William & Mary in Virginia. And his book, of course, The Confidence Map, something that we've talked about. You can check out our past podcasts to hear that conversation. The Confidence Map, charting a path from chaos to clarity. Peter, of course, joining us there from Pennsylvania. I'm driving in my car, I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive me crazy. It's the question that drives us.
This is the drive to the close. That funk to music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, TikTok, everybody got about 18, 19 minutes left in today's trading session, bouncing around on the equity side of things. Uh, but we are up across the board, as you just heard from Charlie. Uh, but call it little changed at, at this hour, We're definitely off our peaks of the session. But we, you know, have been thinking, could we get another record on the S&P 500 today? Bill Maloney just reminded us to look at Bitcoin up 6% today. Well, this plays into what folks have said the Trump trade is on. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, we'll see what our guest has to say. Miriam Bartels is with us. She's chief investment strategist for Sanctuary, Sanctuary Wealth, and she joins us once again in New York City. Miriam, good to have you back with us. I'm not quite sure where to start, but we have asked a lot of folks over the last couple of hours about this Trump trade. Um, you've watched a lot of market cycles, uh, political or other. Uh, how are you thinking about today's market environment and what really matters to the investment trade? A great question, Carol. Obviously, what we're what we have been seeing since the presidential debate between Trump and Biden, and the events over the weekend with the attempt on uh, Trump's life, are totally unprecedented. Uh, but we started making the argument that once uh, we saw how Biden performed during the debate, we started to see the market start pricing in a Trump win. And I'm sure you've had other guests talk about all the betting sites. The betting sites are heavily now leaning towards a Trump win uh, after the events this weekend. And we really started to see the markets also pivot after the CPI report. The CPI report came in uh, better than expected. And we've really started to see a shift out of technology, particularly but semis, into cyclicals. Hmm. And uh, we think that has a lot to do with the direction of interest rates, with the market pricing in uh, the Fed cutting uh, rates in September, and really starting to price in a soft landing. So there's a lot of moving parts to the market. Right. But I would, yes. Is that more significant, Marianne? Let's, like, like I said, you, you understand the markets, seen a lot of cycles. Is it really what matters? And I would agree with you since those inflation prints that there's been a very different narrative and uh, rate story, if you will. We've really seen rates all along the U.S. curve move down. Is it much more about that story versus an outcome for the presidential election? Or tell me, it's both. At the end of the day, Carol, what is most important about the direction of equities over time is earnings. And we're in the early stages of getting second quarter earnings. So it's been our view, earnings are going to be um, better than expected. And that the market probably is also starting to price in where they're seeing earnings next year. And at least uh, from the analyst bottom up, they're still forecasting double digit growth in earnings so I, I think earnings are the main driver, mm -hmm. but the topics of today are also going to have an additional factor on top of how stocks behave. You have a um, target range of 5,600 to 5,800 for the S&P 500. We're right now at 5,625, Marianne. Um, are you gonna raise that range before the end of the year? So we didn't technically raise our range, but I did um, about a month ago, or maybe a little bit more than a month ago, try to take a longer term view on what is the true track that the market is on. And I think the true track is a range of 6,000 to 7,000. The question is, do we get a good correction in the fall? Can we get a good 10% correction? Because I think that sustains prices of the market over time or do we continue to rally and get so extended that we have a deeper correction going into next year? But either way, what I've argued is that the secular trend for the market is a bull market. And I see this market powering higher into 20, 2029, 2030. Probably we'll have a bear market before then, but don't be frightened away from it because I still think we're gonna power higher. So that's 6,000 to 7,000, what's the time frame on that for the S&P 500? You know, Carol, that's a great question. You know, sometimes it's hard to put a time frame. I've I've thought that that's kind of a fool's game mm. to really do a long term target. I'm comfortable over the next two years reaching that target for the market. 
Over the next two years. Okay. Go ahead, Carol. Well, and so question. as you said, well, you know, at some point we'll get a bear market. Recession in there somewhere as well. I mean, one of the things that we've seen certainly in the conversation coming out of Jay Powell, we just talked to David Rubenstein of Carlisle Group, who interviewed Jay Powell earlier today at the Economic Club in Washington. Jay Powell talking a lot more about the dual mandate and more specifically, not just the inflation side of the equation, but what's going on in softness in the labor market. Is a recession kind of a given thing at some point as well, in your view? Historically, Carol, we used to have recessions every four years. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it, 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 if, if you're going to use history as a barometer at some point between now and 2029, 2030, we probably should have a recession. Um, but it would be a recession that would take stocks down but give investors an opportunity to buy. I don't think it would be a major uh, bear market that puts us into what I call a secular bear market. So I think with the um, AI coming into play, we'll get increased productivity over time. I think the market behavior is very similar to 1995 to 2000. Hmm. And I think we're around 1995. So I think we still have a very long runway for equities to go up. Do you think, though, that they'll end with a crash like we saw at the end of the dot-com bubble? Uh, I've actually um, agree with Ed Yardeni that it's the roaring 20s. And I went back and compared the NASDAQ 100 to the Dow, because that's the one that we have back into the 20s. And the technical patterns between today and that period are frighteningly very close. So okay. when I think we're in the early stages of a bubble, and if we're correct about that, well, it will not end in a positive way. Yeah. So yeah, just to remind everybody, after the Roaring Twenties came the Great Depression, which started in 1929. So are you saying that you're looking at a situation like that? I'm not calling for a depression, but you could have markets collapse 50, 60 percent. And that's painful. What that's painful to watch your portfolio to be cut in half. Yeah, yeah. that's a major haircut. Just imagining it right now. Uh, I don't want to imagine it. But <laughs> yep, markets go up, markets go down. All right, Marianne, uh, so good to check in with you once again. Marianne Bartels, Chief Investment Strategist for Sanctuary Wealth, joining us in New York City. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.